My name's Paul Bollinger. I've been a woodcarver since 1980. In the year 2019, I started to carve what I call the Sea Monster Cask. It took me until 2020 to finish carving it, at which time my wife Camille and a couple of her friends painted the carving. And so this video is about acquiring, designing, and carving this sea monster cask, as I call it. I started carving in 1980, and somewhere along the way, I learned how to carve in the round. And somehow again, I ended up being fascinated by Father Christmas. I wanted to carve Father Christmas, I wanted to learn more about Father Christmas, and eventually my wife became enthused and learned how to paint. And she developed a painting technique using oil paint to paint the lindenwood carvings that I had done of Father Christmas. We became well known for these paintings, but I still wanted to learn to carve other things. When we moved to Virginia, we had a wine cellar put into our house. And so I thought it would be fun to learn to carve the ends of wine barrels. So I acquired some wine barrels and I learned to carve them and my wife painted them. These are a couple examples of the carved tops or ends of two, what I would call normal size wine barrels, something on the order of 50 to 55 gallons. I didn't know when I was doing these that someday I was going to be carving wine casks 10 or 15 times this size. But exactly that happened. Eventually, I found a large oval cask on the internet in Germany. I bought it, I had it shipped here to Virginia. I took it apart and I ended up carving both ends of that cask. I carved it using the same tools I'd been using for almost 40 years. The same tools that I used to carve Father Christmas. The same tools wood carvers have been using for hundreds, if not thousands of years. And so this video is the story of that original barrel, but really it's the story of the cask that became the great sea monster cask. I had the tools, I had the skills, I acquired the cask, and so after I had the inspiration, which is covered in a separate video, I ended up carving this cask. And so I thought it might help right here for you to be able to see the end product and watch this video about how it came about how it was designed, how it was carved, and then how it was turned over to be painted. But before the Sea Monster cask, there was another one. This is the one that I found on the internet in Germany, in Bad Durkheim, Germany. I bought it on the internet and I had it shipped from Germany to Haymarket, Virginia. The shipping cost way more than buying the cask itself. It was old, more than a hundred years old. It was bigger, a little bit, than the Sea Monster cask. It was heavier, and the wood, being older like that, was more difficult to carve. But I learned how to do it, and in learning how to do that, I prepared myself, although I didn't know it, for carving the Sea Monster cask. All I needed was the inspiration to do that next cask. Look for a minute at the first cask, the two ends from the first cask. The cask I bought from Bad Durkheim, the cask that was built between 1900 and 1920. The design on the left was inspired by a trip to the Fetchen house in Taos. Fetchin carved his own house when he was not busy painting. 
carved all the wood in his house and I really liked some of the designs. The other bear was inspired by Germany, by the Weinstrasse, by the castles, by the city crests, by a trip that my wife and I took to the German countryside, and by the fact that I was in grade school there when my father was in the army. And so this cask was bigger, six feet by five feet, heavier, 350 pounds each end, versus about 250 pounds for the sea monster cask. But by far, the sea monster cask is more complex than either of these. So once more on the internet, I found a cask. This time it wasn't in Germany. It was in Pennsylvania. But it had come from Italy. It was there in a warehouse in Pennsylvania, and it was not going to be used in the wine industry. And so I bought it, and my wife Camille and I rented a U-Haul truck, and we went up to Pennsylvania one morning. It took all day, really, to get up there and back, but we went up, went to the warehouse, got that loaded into our truck, and brought it back home. And so this is the warehouse crew digging that cask out from the back of the warehouse and bringing it out to us. We had the U-Haul truck, they had a forklift, the cask weighed more than 500 pounds, and so they loaded it into the back of the U-Haul truck and we secured it, and then we headed back home. The round trip took all day and into the evening. So there we were with our truck and our cask, and we made it home after dark. Look at the cask for a minute. This is the cask before I bought it. When I acquired it, it didn't have the metal clean-out door on it. But it was the same size and it was in pretty good condition like this. Way better condition than the original cask I had from Germany. And so you can see how beautiful it is. How intriguing it is to have this basically what's a piece of art already sitting there wanting or asking me to embellish it, turning it into something that's really uh, for the ages. We got home after dark and the next morning I had arranged for neighbors and friends and my son Jake to help us unload the truck. And you saw that it took a forklift to get the cask into the truck and I thought it was going to take pretty much some heavy-duty effort to get it back out. I had built a ramp, I strapped the ramp to the back of the truck, and I thought I was going to have to pull that cask out of there with my car, using the trailer hitch and a rope. But our neighbors dug in, went in there, pushed that cask out, and it slid right down the, the ramp that I had built. And in just a few minutes, it was out onto the dolly that we had waiting for it. So there we were, the wheeled dolly waiting. The cask slid down, tipped over, and landed perfectly in the middle of that wheeled dolly, and we were unloaded. With the cask sitting perfectly on the wheeled dolly, we just rolled it right into the garage. That dolly worked so well, unbelievable. And the cask came right into the garage, and you can see how big it is here in this picture sitting in my garage with a couple of my happy neighbors who had helped me get it out of that truck. Examining the cask, you can see that clearly one end is much nicer than the other. One end is pristine, nice and clean. The other end where that metal clean-out door had been, the door was missing and there's a rather large hole there that has to be figured into a carving. And then from the side, you can see that the cask has been used a little bit. There's stains, but those kind of things don't really matter because I'm concerned about the end of it. And the end looked so great to me, I couldn't really wait to get started. So what does getting started mean? Well, it means that I have to break that cask down 
into the two usable ends that I can carve. And so I needed to cut the barrel below the first two bands on either end so that I could keep those two ends and have them to carve. And in the middle, all that extra wood, I donated, gave to a local person who makes furniture out of old wine barrels. And so it got recycled into some probably very nice furniture. And I ended up with the two ends that I wanted for my carving. Remember, I'm a wood carver, not a carpenter. Um, so I took the ramp that I'd used with my friends to get the cask off the truck, strapped it to the side of the cask, and then sawed off the first end, the end I really wanted, uh, just below the second metal band. And so I thought it would slide down that ramp, and in fact it did. So it slid right down onto the ground, right off the top of that cask as it sat down onto the ground, and there it was for me to figure out what to do with it. And so you can see how it got separated and how good it looks just sitting there. My dear friend, uh, who has died since, Mike Anderson, Dr. Mike Anderson, uh, my neighbor and my friend, uh, was there the entire time helping me. And uh, between the two of us, we got that top off and we had it ready. And I chose to work on the best top first. That's the one that would become the Sea Monster cask. I had to cut away the part that I didn't want because I wanted to save the other end, which is of course in this picture on the bottom. And so I had to cut the staves away, remove the metal bands, and I gave the staves to a local person who made furniture from barrels. And I actually ended up giving the bands to my friend Jane Smith, who used them in her garden. And so this is a picture of starting to cut away and removing the staves. And after quite a bit of effort, the staves are cut. And eventually you see here one happy woodcarver cutting away the last stave and letting it fall and celebrating with his little electric saw, battery operated saw that made it all the way through the top and the bottom of getting that cask cut down so that it could be used. Once it was cut down, it was fairly easy between my son, myself, Mike Anderson, to move that cask and actually get it hauled up, hoisted up onto the carving rack that I had built for it. Using a boat winch as a hoist, I was able to get a hold of it, hoist it right up there, where it has been sitting for two years, uh, being carved, being designed, carved, and then eventually painted right there on the same rack. And so that's the way it looks before anything has ever been done to it. It's been removed, put on the rack, and now it's waiting. So exactly how do you design something like that? Well, I approached it by figuring out what I wanted to do for the Sea Monster cask and getting cartoons basically of the items that would be part of the design and I pasted it up on a table that we had. So you can see I took some tape and I made a shape approximately the same size as the face of that cask on a nice cherry wood table. Believe me, sometimes I thought about how much fun it would be to carve that table, but that never happened. So here's a layup or a layout of some ideas, original, very first ideas that don't really exist. That, well, a couple may have gotten into the final uh, cask, but not many. But the idea was to figure out how big things should be. How would they fit? How would it flow? And so that's what I took a look at when I was doing it. Then, on the actual face of the cask, I started to paste up more elaborate, more near the finished product type cartoons. Now you can see 
a little bit of humor at the bottom. At that time, I thought that this would be finished in 2019. In fact, the carving and the painting was not finished until after the middle of the summer in 2020. And so things uh, happen, right? And stuff happens. But uh, the, uh, the idea was to make this layout and then eventually transfer these drawings or cartoons directly onto the surface of the cask uh, so the carving could begin. When the cartoons had been transferred the to the cask, I could start carving. And so you can see here in this picture, you're thinking, what a mess. Uh, this is the work area. There's the cask I'm working on. And behind it, if you'll notice, is the other one. The one where the cutout door has been removed. It's going to become a cask a design and something I carve later. So the sea monster cask is on the rack and it's being carved. Of course, I'm carving it with the tools that I have, the woodcarver's gouges, and I'm working away piece by piece, design by design. One of the nice things about this cask was each design was individual. I could work on it, move on to the next one, go back. I didn't have to complete anything and so I worked across the face of the entire cask so that I could see how it would set in. And eventually I ended up doing that three times to get the depth of carving needed to actually have a substantial, beautiful carving. And so you can see, you move along, chip by chip, piece by piece, outlining, carving, removing the part that isn't wanted, leaving the part that is wanted. Always guided by your cartoons. When you're ready to carve where a cartoon was, you move it aside and keep it so that you can see what it was you intended to do. So at least three passes. In some areas, it was more than that to get the design sunk in far enough to make it substantial. This is an early pass. This is the first pass. And so here's a monster on the left being outlined and just a little bit of carving to get away uh, the material that you're not going to want so you can see the monster. And on the right you can see, you know, how all that stuff fits together in the bigger picture. So it's a very, very tedious, time-consuming process. Um, not even inch by inch, half inch by half inch, quarter inch by quarter inch, stroke by stroke. In this picture, it has been gone over several times, and it's ready, really, to be turned over to the painters. And I can tell that because when I look at it, I know right at the end, when I was ready, I pasted some colored pictures on there to give Camille and her friends, who were going to help her paint, ideas of what the colors might look like when they were done. And still, humorously, I thought it would be done 2019. So piece by piece, element by element, chip by chip. The designs come out slowly, one at a time, very, very slowly. And so eventually the cask was ready. It's ready to be handed over to Camille and her friends to paint. And I thought I could build a little time-lapse image here for you to see how it all came together, just to refresh your mind on this. So remember this picture of the beautiful cask end. The cartoons were laid up onto the cask end. Carving began piece by piece, layer by layer, item by item. Carve a cartoon, remove a cartoon, carve a cartoon. More of the barrel becomes carved, the first pass, the second pass, the third pass. At some point, I looked at it and said, I need to think about what the colors might look like. Am I done? Am I ready to turn it over? And then finally, at the end, you can see how deeply carved it is, how it stands out on its own without the paint, although the painting makes it a masterpiece. 
but the carving set the stage for the painting. You can see the designs here. You can see the size of it. You can see the complexity of it. And you really, really can't wait to see what it looks like when it gets painted. So that's the story of carving the great sea monster cask. We have two other videos you can see. One is about the inspiration for the sea monster cask, and the other is about the painting of the great sea monster cask. Thanks very much for watching.